You are listening to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all the latest news, Overwatch League results, and mishaps in Overwatch. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk and Edinar. What is up, guys, and welcome back to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all things Overwatch. I am your host, Molly Drunk, and tonight on episode 132, we'll be discussing the latest in Overwatch, Overwatch League, and see what's buzzing in this week's hot community topics. But before we can get into the news and introduce you to my co-host, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who is in and out with us on Twitch for our live show tonight, and of course, thank all of our repeat listeners out there. So joining me tonight, as you can see, is my co-host Edinar. And Edinar, you know we've uh, we've been kind of like been hit with like this slew of information these past couple of mm -hmm. days uh, between the new event drop in. We got the new patch that was you know patched from the PTR with a ton of balance changes. We got Overwatch League Season Two format details that dropped earlier this afternoon, and you know a couple other things here and there. So uh, you ready to jump into the thick of things tonight? Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, like a super lot. Like um, even just today, like a whole bunch of information <laughs> kind of dropped. I'm like, oh, Totem's going to have to restart the notes like four times, <laughs> keep adding stuff. But luckily, yeah. luckily, I didn't start the notes until today. <laughs> See, there you go. It's wise to just wait to the last minute to do things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I'm, ex I'm excited. Uh, you know, we played a little bit yesterday. I'm sure we'll play tomorrow. Heck, we might even play it after this, after the podcast tonight. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying the new stuff. Absolutely, and uh, you know, like Halloween is here, basically in Overwatch. You know, not not all of the skins were actually leaked ahead of time, which was actually pretty cool. But you know, we we did see the vast majority of the stuff, and I have to say, like all in all, uh, just across the board, the cosmetics from this event are probably my favorite out of any event that we have had so far. But you know, we'll we'll talk all about. Halloween terror when we get to our main discussion, you know, we'll re go over what dropped uh, with the event in patch 1.29, but let's go ahead and let's jump into this week's news because we get a lot to cover. So first up, one of the big things that dropped today was our first look and first release really of a Lego Overwatch set. Mm -hmm. So, the official Overwatch Twitter account previewed the first Lego set that's available to purchase via the Blizzard gear store. And the first building set belongs to Omnic Bastion. So, this figure can actually swivel at the waist, it can move its arms, it cannot go into turret mode, uh, which isn't like a huge deal to me, primarily just due to the fact that, uh, for one, this building set only has 182 pieces, it would be very hard to kind of like work everything in with the Bastion figure. In something that's this small scale in regards to the build, if we get something a little bit more large scale, like some of the like Marvel superheroes uh, that mm -hmm. we have seen with Lego, then that I could definitely see get in the turret form. But for me, like the thing that makes this a much must purchase, uh, not that I wasn't going to buy it anyway, but it's the fact that Ganymede is included. So, you know, you get Bastion's friendly bird sidekick included with uh, this set, which is you know, pretty big deal, and, uh, you know, as I said, this is 182 pieces, it stands a little bit over 4 inches tall, and while, yes, there are limited quantities available for this Bastion set, if you're going to BlizzCon, or, you know, if you have the virtual ticket, uh, this will be part of the BlizzCon sale as well, so be sure to keep an eye out for this one, and, you know, this is, uh, Honestly, like, I was not expecting to get a release already, so this was a nice surprise, and uh, price point-wise, we're looking at $25 for this particular build. But all in all, like, I'm shocked that we actually got to see uh, an actual set release already. I was expecting it to maybe coincide with the Nerf Rival series in 2019, so uh, good on Blizzard for, you know, kind of pulling a quick one over us in this case. Yeah, I was actually, I mean, I was more surprised on who the first one was, um, that they went with Bastion of all things. But, I mean, when you think about it, Bastion's probably the easiest to design. Right. I mean, it's it's a robot. Like, how easy is it to do a Lego robot? Um, so, I, I mean, I get that. And it's, yeah, 
I mean, I'm ordering it. That's mm. a guarantee. $25 for a Lego piece is, I think that's a better investment than like a Funko Pop. Right. To, to me, because I, I personally like Legos better than, than Funko Pops. Not to say I don't like them. It's just I'm not on spider level of Funko Pop. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, no, and twenty five dollars is not crazy expensive for something like this. So I mean, if you have a Overwatch, you know, relative or friend uh, who loves Overwatch, this is w- right in the Secret Santa, you know, type of gift giving range dollar range. So this is perfect, great price point for this. Couldn't be happier with it. Uh, I just want more now. Like I want the whole set. Absolutely, and what what was really curious to me about this is the fact that they went out of the gate with something that wasn't, like, a base skin. They actually went with the Omnic one from, you know, the uh, the Retribution event, uh, which or the Archives, depending on how you want to label it, which really caught me by surprise, too, because traditionally, like, we get, like, the base model, and then later on they've started to introduce skin variants with different merchandise, but with the LEGO stuff, they just went right out of the gate with it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, like, it was, when you, if it didn't say Overwatch on it, like, it, it looks like Bastion, but it's not the traditional Bastion that you're used to seeing. Um, so, yeah, no, I was happy with it. I was very happy with, like, the skin design, because they're not going with, like, just the base set. That that gives me hope that we're going to get, like, some some great skins from other characters. And, and we've talked about this before, like, with statues, like, you know, all the Mercy ones that they could do, Tracer, Widowmaker, uh, you know, all McCree, all of them. So this gives me hope that they're going to have different skins for other Overwatch heroes besides their just basic run-of-the-mill skins. Yeah, and with these skins, they've also started to branch out with their Funko Pop figures as well because, you know, not only did we get... Uh, the Lego release. We also got a ton of new merchandise available on the gear store in regards to Halloween Terror. So, uh, you know, this is just Blizzard's way of celebrating the season. And we got two new Funko Pop figures. Uh, and they're listed at $15 right now on the Blizzard gear store. The first one is Cultus Zenyatta, which amazing skin. <laughs> and uh, the Funko Pop is pretty good too. And of course, you know, we had to get Witch Mercy. Uh, so that one was an immediate buy for me. Um, I'll probably get the Zenyatta one too, because that, other than the Nutcracker one, you know, the, the Cultist Zenyatta, uh, is my favorite Zenyatta skin. Not, not to take anything away from the Fastball Zenyatta one from the Summer Games, because I do like that one too. Uh, but the, the bad thing about those is, uh, you're not going to get it in time for Halloween. The expected delivery date for that uh, so sometime before November 30th, that's a pretty big window uh, in regards to when you're going to be getting this product. Uh, so other than that, uh, we also have some new cute but deadly figures, uh, which feature some of the Halloween skins. So, you know, you got the Hanzo, uh, like the zombie Hanzo and the vampire Symmetra. Uh, so those are $10 each. We also got a new patchy plush Hainer, which is available for $10. It has a mummy theme, so, you know, I'm sure my soulmate Slambo is going to be all over that. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, you know, there's some new t-shirts, some new hoodies. Uh, they also have, like, some new leggings for different characters, like Hanzo, uh, you know, Diva, Widow Tracer, some of those we've already seen prior. Uh, and they also have, like, a Symmetra dress for, like, her outfit, which is pretty cool. So, all in all, like... They just, like, open the floodgates when it comes to the merchandise and, you know, the, the BlizzCon sales coming up pretty soon as well. So, you know, it's just going to be, like, uh, throwing your money at the screen, basically, at Blizzard. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, I said this last week, I really hope they do this with all the Christmas skins because mm-hmm. I would go crazy for those. Like, the Zenyatta skin's cool. You know, it's a squid. You know, it's a great one. You know, the, the the Junkenstein and the Junkenstein's monster ones are from last year. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I hope I want them to do the same stuff with the Christmas stuff, too. Right. So I'm hoping they do that. I don't know if I'm going to go crazy on these just yet. But that's not to say one night I couldn't have a couple cocktails <laughs> and uh, put a few of these in the uh, the carts with the Legos. And just 
do stupid things. Yeah, and you wake up the next morning and you're wondering why there's a, you know, withdrawal of like two hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, you're like oh god, receipt from Blizzard. Worst email I can get because I'm like, Shh, what did I buy? I I stopped myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you're just like you're like. Oh, but you, you stopped yourself from dude. swearing, but not from actually buying stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd still buy it. Um, I've definitely done that before. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, it, it will be good. It's you know, more Overwatch stuff is always good. More options. The only thing I ask is, give me more hoodies. Mm-hmm. They really lack in the hoodie department. Outside of like the ultimate hoodies from Jinx, that's the yeah, only exception. Like, yes, um, but like Blizzard, come on, give us some some hoodies. Even like Overwatch League hoodies, mm-hmm. I don't think they really have those. Yeah, there's like they, track they jackets, now, basically. Yeah, I don't want a track jacket. I want a hoodie. So you know, make that happen. You'd sell a lot of them. So hopefully that comes around soon. Absolutely, uh, and. There are other things that are coming out pretty soon. This is actually targeted for a December release. And uh, this is something you can buy at the grocery store. Uh, that's because now we have a little bit of a continuation of their partnership, uh, you know, promotions between Blizzard and Kellogg's. So Kel- Kellogg's is set to release an Overwatch branded cereal. Lucy o- O's! <laughs> you know, based on the in-game spray, which is a you know fa- fan favorite. And, uh, it's expected to drop sometime in early December. I think they, like, listed December 3rd for the release. Uh, but it, it's kind of hard to tell, like, what sort of cereal it is. It kind of looks like Apple Jacks. Uh, but the, the cereal in itself is, like, green and yellow, obviously, for, like, his healing auras. And it's, it's listed as Sonic Vanilla. Whatever the hell that is. <laughs> uh, but what's cool about this is there's a promotion going when you buy the box of cereal that you get a loot box boost. Now, this boost is basically going to give you an extra loot box when a player levels up in-game, meaning that when you level up, you'll get two loot boxes instead of one. Now, with that being said, Adenar, like, is this going to be, like, a one-time thing where you only get, like, one initial loot box, or is this going to be something that, you know, maybe they'll set to, like, a 5, 10 level limit? What, what are you thinking here? I mean... That's a lot to go through for one loot box. Mm-hmm. I it, I think it would. It, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be permanent. Um, but you know, I could see them doing more of a five ten type of thing. The next five levels you do, you get an extra loot box, or next five loot boxes you get overall. So that could be your you know arcade loot boxes. Mm-hmm. You get you get a double, and so your next five loot boxes you get double. That would make more sense. <clears throat> I don't know if they'd go more than five. That seemed a little little much because, yeah, yeah, it just would seem like too much because I think, what, five loot boxes is, what, four ninety nine, seven ninety nine. I can't even remember what it, what <laughs> the actual loot boxes cost. Um, but, like, the cereal itself probably costs $4, four or right. five bucks. So, like, you're not going to lose money by, you know, having to pay five bucks you get cereal and then you give away 10 loot boxes that's just uh losing money right there um and you forgot to also point out that they're green and yellow like the green bay packers well no no one cares about the packers i don't know i feel a lot of people do it's also okay okay (laughs) okay so mason crosby doesn't care about the packers based on Mm -hmm. his performance last week I, I, I'm, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad I don't have him on my fantasy league. <laughs> yeah, but that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, too soon, too soon. We don't bring that up yet. Uh, but but looking at this, like I, I like I just had this feeling like it's gonna be like a one time thing. Like whenever you level mm-hmm. up, you'll get an additional one, just based on the cost of you know what the average cereal is compared to like the average cost of the loot boxes, and also like kind of like tying it into you know how uh like the price point of what like the pop tarts promotion was buying the three boxes and then getting that loot box uh and you know speaking of loot boxes if you are a twitch prime member you're in luck there's actually a second golden loot box for you to claim from october so you can uh redeem this golden loot box until november 5th 
So what I have to do is, you know, visit the loot page on Twitch with your Battle.net account connected in order to unlock the box. And, you know, just as a reminder, the golden loot boxes are different in the sense that you are guaranteed at least one item of legendary value. But just note, like, yes, there is an event going on, but the golden loot box is completely separate from the event. So you're not going to be getting any Halloween terror, you know, mm -hmm. items out of this golden loot box. Uh, so, you know, every time we get, like, Twitch Prime loot, you know, we always gotta bring up really not much to discuss about it, but, you know, it's not every month that we've been seeing, like, double the rewards, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, I got Odette Widowmaker last night when we were actually playing. Like, I redeemed it while we were playing, and I got the, the Widowmaker skin, so I can go into Junkenstein's Revenge in style. No? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay uh in in other overwatch related news maybe not directly related to the game in itself but i for one saw this and i just about fell out of my chair because i'm excited to test this out uh so if you're a fan of overwatch and you know you're also a fan of like old school shooters uh i have some news for you there's actually a new mod for the classic version of doom that basically uh brings in overwatch weaponry into the game so you know you can like rip through you know the demons of hell uh with you know a couple different characters uh they have like the Wintermaker sniper rifle and the auto rifle uh they also have lucio sonic amplifier sombra's smg as well as diva's mecha which is pretty cool uh the downside is yes there's weapons in the game for uh this overwatch mod for doom but you know there's no special abilities or ultimates you know you're still uh at it with just your guns, but still, like, this is something that, you know, you just wouldn't come to expect. There's been times in the past where we've seen, like, mods for, like, Street Fighter, you know, where someone might port, like, a model over so you can play that character to the game, uh, but it's very rare to see it on something that's, uh, a little more retro in a sense, so, you know, I'm a huge Doom fan, as that was what got me into the FPS genre in the first place, and obviously Overwatch made me fall back in love with it so it's a nice marion of the two yeah it's i mean it's weird to think that people like people go back to these old games all the time i've come to realize mm -hmm. like even like on twitch like you get all these speed runners stuff like that but to think that somebody spent the time to be like you know what would be awesome if we put overwatch guns into a game that's 20 years old like who thinks of that and is like, I'm going to spend a lot of time doing this. <laughs> like, I'm just like, more power to you. I don't think it's going to get me to go back and play Doom. Because honestly, I don't think I have my copy of Doom. Is it free? Like, if it's free, I'll do it. But I doubt it's free anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I guarantee you, I do not have Doom in on any of my computers. Right. So... Uh, I mean, it's it's a cool, it's it's nice, it's cool. Um, any game that you can do mods like that too, is, you're gonna see interesting things like this, and you know maybe we'll get some more, you know, Overwatch type stuff in other games that you know allow mods and stuff like that. Uh, so so it's pretty cool, but I mean I don't know if I'm gonna go out and download doom so i can try this i out. mean i i know i for sure have it on my steam library just because uh during one of the sales you know they had like the entire collection of the doom franchise basically uh so i picked that up so it included like doom doom 2 uh doom final doom 3 uh this was before like the newer ones came out when they like rebooted it uh so I'll have to see if it works that way, or if it has to be, like, a different sort of port. But either way, I want to check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, but, no, we had some uh, some pretty big Overwatch League news that dropped mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of people are talking about because it does kind of shake things up. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's jump into our hot community topics from this past week. So first up, this also is Overwatch League related uh, in regards to one of the expansion teams, and that is that Billy Billy... Uh, the owners of the Hanzu Overwatch League expansion team, so, you know, one of the three Chinese expansion teams, uh, have actually gone out and filed a new trademark. Now, this trademark is for the team name Railgun. So, what Billy Billy did was, you know, they went to the community on Twitter, uh, they released, like, 
I want to say it was like two or three polls that had like a number of different uh, like name ideas for, you know, this franchise. And uh, Real Gun, I guess, was like the top one between the three. Now, that being said, uh, I remember when they first started these polls and I kind of looked at the names and a lot of them just kind of kind of fell flat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not like completely sold on Real Gun either. Uh, but like, what what are your thoughts on this as a franchise name for an Overwatch League team? Yeah, real stupid. Just gonna flat out say that. Real stupid. Like, here come the rail guns. I mean, first off, the majority of people don't even know what a rail gun is. Let's just put that <laughs> out there. Like, majority of people, like, if you're like, well, it's a kind of gun. Yeah, we got that. Second half of the thing. What is the first half? Uh, you know, it, for those out there, it's an electromagnetic gun. Um, <laughs> like, it's just, I don't know. They, I feel they could have come up with a better name. Because, like, when you do city-located teams, you want, like, team names that relate to that area. Mm -hmm. Houston Outlaws. Dallas Fuel. You know, LA Valiant, but, you know, you don't think, hey, you know what makes me think of China? Rail guns. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're just like, sorry, it's not the first thing that comes to, like, oh, China. Like, it's just, I, they could have done something that could have done more home. Like, Shanghai mm -hmm. Dragons. Shanghai Dragons makes sense. Dragons are very big in Chinese culture. I doubt rail guns are very big in Chinese culture. So I, I just I just think that they could have because everyone's gonna call them the rail guns and they're not gonna call them by their first name, the, like their city name, because the majority of people don't know how to pronounce the this city's name. So they're gonna call them the rail guns and it's just gonna be it's gonna be weird. It's I don't know. I I it's weird. What do you think of it? I I I honestly, like, when I looked at the Twitter poll when it first came out, I didn't really like any of the names. Uh, so it was basically, like, I I have no pick in this field. <laughs> like, so, uh, so whether or not this is, is going to be the name, like, to me, like, when I heard Railgun, and when I looked at a lot of, like, the name options, I was like, was something lost in translation when it came to these Twitter options? Or was it something else? I don't know. It just... It doesn't really roll off the ton for me, but uh, in regards to this expansion team uh, for Hanzu, you know, it's been pretty quiet on their front. This is one of the expansion teams that haven't really announced anything uh, in regards to, like, their players. They haven't even announced any of the staff members. And, you know, the expansion team exclusive uh, free agent window uh, in regards to sign-ins did come to a close. So now the free agency is open to all teams. And the teams have until December 8th to have eight contracted players on their roster. Now, that being said, you know, the Overwatch League dropped some pretty big news uh, in regards to, you know, format changes, when the league is starting up again, and that dropped earlier today. So let's go through what's coming for Season 2. So, Season 2 is kicking off on a Thursday, February 14th. So, Aww. for Sorry. one, <laughs> yes, you can get sentimental about it being Valentine's Day. Uh, for one, it's a Thursday, right? Like, we're so used to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, does, are we potentially looking at Thursday through Sunday games? Or are they going to shorten it to three days? Or so it's just going to be like a one-time thing with the schedule where, you know, maybe they want to start it a little bit later in the week. Um, I... I'd have to do the math on all this because of the way they break out the the um, the matches because there's going to be there's there's obviously more teams but they said teams are also going to have bye weeks or only play one week. Um, I'd have to break out the math. I don't know. Are they going to just do Thursday, Friday, Saturday games? Like I'd have to break out the math. I doubt they would because it would probably be a loss in revenue. The only other thing that came into mind was of why they would start it on a Thursday it has something to do with China. Like has something to do with the timing with them. Oh yeah, it would be a Friday for them. Yeah, it would be a Friday for them. So maybe they just want to do an exhibition weekend 
Like, like the first will be like, you know, they could do Thursday, Friday, and which would be Friday, Saturday for China and stuff like that to kick it off. I don't know until we get the actual set schedule, but it's just, it's super weird that it starts on a Thursday. Uh, Cause there's no reason, there's nothing going on on Wednesday that would prevent it that we know of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, obviously we don't know the full schedule of everything, but it's just, it's going to be weird. It's just, yeah, it's strange. <laughs> Okay, so in regards to the six expansion teams, we know which teams are going to wear in regards to the divisions. Uh, now, we, we kind of brushed up on this on Overwatch League Network, and, you know, some of this stuff was kind of, like, leaked on a Chinese Twitter account, and a lot of what was posted on that account actually uh, is true. Uh, so from the official report, you know, on OverwatchLeague.com, uh, we know that Atlanta, Paris, Toronto, and Washington, D.C., will be joining the Atlantic Division. So for the Pacific Division, we have Chengdu, uh, Guangzhou, uh, Hanzhou, and Vancouver. So in regards to overall matches, uh, they're kind of down quite a bit. Uh, So teams are going to be playing 28 matches over the four stages. Uh, The stages are going to remain five-week stages. So, you know, if my math checks out, you know... um, that's uh, that's seven matches per stage, not including you know any sort of playoffs. So down from ten, mm-hmm. and you know because of this, uh, you know this schedule is going to be very flexible. So you're going to have teams playing anywhere from zero to two matches a week. So yes, that does mean that there are going to be bye weeks for teams. And you know when we look back at season one, it was very evident the amount of strain uh, mm-hmm. that was on the players, especially mentally. And physically at times. And, you know, I, I'm really curious to see how teams are going to approach these bye weeks. Because those teams that have a very good coaching staff, well, that's just an additional week to get prepared for that next game. So the teams that have the better coaching staffs are definitely going to take, you know, full advantage of that extra rest. And, you know, just playing less games overall is also going to just elevate the level of play that we do see. Because the players aren't going to be feeling as stressed or, you know out like being over practice you know things like mm-hmm. that so i'm definitely looking forward to uh just seeing the elevated play from this point on yeah no this was great for player morale and player you know the stress put on them because knowing that they're gonna get like hey we only play one match this week or hey we play zero matches this week it's like it's almost one of those things where you you know you're gonna get time off because I, I can almost guarantee you that a team that um, has a, a bye week, doesn't play at all, is not going to be screaming all seven days or all six days like they normally do. They may scrim like two, three, give people three, four days off. Or let's say, you know, since they have such an international, you know, player base, it'd be the perfect time to be like, hey... I know this happened with New York Excelsior with Pine. He got homesick. It'd be the perfect time to be like, Pine, you know, why don't you take a week and a half off, a week off, go back to Korea for a week, see your family, stuff like that. You know, it's it's going to be great in that aspect. Um, you know, they also, they, I mean, they even pointed out it gives teams more of opportunities to visit their home cities during the season, which I see less of unless they're inside the United States. Uh, or in Canada, um, because, you know, it's just not feasible to be like, hey, let's do this 14-hour flight over to South Korea or however long the flight is and stay over there for three days, probably get some practice in over there and take another 13, 14-hour flight back. So it just doesn't seem very feasible. But I like this better because it's going to make more um, sense for the, the players to, to kind of reset their recharge their batteries and you get less burnout uh especially you know i mean it's the seagull effect seagull said he loved playing in overwatch league but the stress and the amount of work put in it just practicing six days a week 10 hours a day when you weren't actually playing matches is pretty insane like it's it's extremely insane so i i like this i like this a lot same and uh, you know not only did we get changes to 
Uh, you know, just the overall amount of games, he also kind of restructured the playoff scenarios as well. Mm-hmm. So the stage finals have seen some changes, uh, and these will be held after stage one, stage two, and stage three. There's a reason why stage four is absent from this, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but for the stage finals, you now we'll have the top eight teams making the, the stage playoffs. Uh, so... This is all going to be according to the stage records of the teams. So you'll have the division winners from, you know, the Atlantic, the Pacific. So they'll be seated in, you know, number one, number two, uh, followed by the next six teams in the standings. And then, you know, we also have the All-Star Weekend seeing a shift. So it's no longer at the end of the year. Uh, It'll be held between stage two and stage three. And are also expecting the breaks in between these stages to be longer as well. So again, like, getting back to, like, resting your players, you know, players being able to visit, you know, home, basically, just having some off time uh, is always a good thing to get, you know, just recharged. And we also have changes to the season playoffs. So you have the division champions and the next four teams in the standings, regardless of which division they're in qualifying uh, for the season playoffs. Then there are also going to be two additional teams making the playoffs, and this is where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. So for these two positions, at the end of Stage 4, there is going to be a play-in tournament that will put the teams that are ranked 7th through 12th in the overall standings in a win-or-go-home bracket. Now, you know... When when we when we looked at like the Chinese leak, you know they were talking about like having a wild card round. This like blows that out of the water. Like I was not right. expecting to have that many teams still being in the running, and you know everyone knows my my team, right? This mm-hmm. is the Seoul Dynasty ruling of season two, right? Like give them every opportunity that they need in order to make that run. <laughs> That they didn't get in season one, uh, but all in all, like it, it means that like even if you have a rough patch in the season, you still have a way to make it into the season playoffs, which is great. It, it's never truly over until the very end, rather than being like halfway and being like, okay, we're mathematically eliminated at this point outside of like a stage playoff. So it just opens up more opportunities for these teams. Uh, that would be, you know, kind of middle of the pack, uh, and, you know, maybe not having won any of the stages, still having a shot at uh, some money. Yeah, okay, first, before I get into the playoffs and how much I love it, um, I want to just say one thing about the All-Star game. I I like the fact that they moved the All-Star game into the middle of the season, because from a fan perspective, you kind of lose interest a little, after the grand finals and then waiting such a long time between the grand finals and the all-star you kind of lose interest and you saw that from the viewership and i'm pretty sure overwatch saw that from the viewership uh from a player perspective so between week two and uh, season two and stage two and three doing it again (laughs) totem between stage two and three i'm assuming they'll have like a three-week break between stage two and three have a week off on both sides and then the all-star game in the middle I have a sneaking suspicion that you're going to start to get some players who opt out of the All-Star game who get voted in. Um, Just like you do in any of the sports that have the All-Star game in the middle. Because they're going to opt out to R&R. Do some R&R, go back home, so on and so forth. I I have no problem with players doing that. The All-Star game is fun regardless. But you're going to probably start to see players do that. Um, so that's my two cents on the All-Star game. The playoffs, I love the fact, because they're, they're adding more drama in it to it by doing like, okay, the two top two from the 7 through 12 playoff bracket get in. And here's the question I have. If you use a normal, you can't use a normal bracket because it's six teams. So does that mean the 7th and the 8th place team have like essentially first round buys? Hmm. Because, like, yeah, you if you do a bracket, you have three on each side. So the 7th and 8th would probably have a bye. And then, you know, the 10th and 11th play each other. And the 9th and the 12th team play each other. Yeah, you know, some, some sort of variation of that. I would assume that's how it goes. But, man, the first time the 12th seed 
makes the playoffs is going to be lit. Like people, <laughs> like it's it's the it's the March Madness syndrome. Right. It's the Cinderella story. People are going to be cheering crazy for that. Like this year, it would have been the Dallas Fuel. Like the Dallas Fuel came on hot at the end of season one. They were the team that could have been like gone on to win this, you know, seventh through twelfth place team thing and gone into the playoffs and and probably held their own pretty well, maybe even won a match or two. Um, so it's going to be interesting. It just adds more drama. It adds more of the the March Madness feel to it. So I'm super excited about that. Super excited. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm also curious to see, like, how that's going to uh, come into play with, like, these pick'em sites uh, or even fantasy leagues, for that matter, as well. If they're going to have, like, a separate sort of, like, scoring system or if it will just be additive, uh, you know, to who you currently have. Just knowing how many potential players you would have fielded on your roster uh, in that case. Uh, but, you know, that's not all the Overwatch League news that we have because, you know, we got a ton of other stuff that we got to talk about as we go inside the league so first up something we got to talk about is overwatch league uh and observers because uh we do know that the contracts of the overwatch league observers for jason baker and imagine were not renewed for season two baker had served as a lead observer uh observer director and was in charge of basically you know the way that uh, the game was spectated in season one his work would continue on to the World Cup group stages this year. And then Imagine was basically the guy that was behind the main free camera observing uh, during the first season. And, you know, also worked in the World Cup as well. And, you know, Baker made a comment that, well, Imagine was the guy who basically invented how the free cam works in Overwatch. And we haven't really heard anything since then. You know, there's been no uh, replacement announcements uh, for either one of these positions. And for the most part, like, if you browse Twitter or if you follow any of the Blizzard employees that worked with the Overwatch League, this was news that shocked the hell out of everyone. It was so, mm -hmm. like, completely out of left field, unexpected. And, you know, these are guys that have very extensive experience working in esports productions, whether it was with stints with, like, ESL, you know, E-League, MLG, and... You know, like, I'm not going to say that Observing was perfect in Season 1, because it was not. Uh, no. You know, there there were some times that, you know, uh, you know you'd miss a big play. But that's, that's what the replay system is for, right? There's always the opportunity to go back to see what you miss. If you did miss, like, a huge, like, a random, like, like, well, use the World Cup, for instance. Like, let's say they miss Kodak getting that 5k on Zenyatta on Route 66. Like, you always have the option to click in the kill feed uh, with the replay system to still be able to view that play. Uh, but it seems like, for the most part, Baker was just looking uh, to play up the narrative of the stories that were going on. You know, a lot of emphasis was kind of, like, put on... The Widowmaker duels, for instance, because Widowmaker was one of the more prominent characters in Season 1. Uh, so there were times where maybe, like, maybe some people thought that they were on that duel too long. Or maybe, like, the Pharah versus Pharah air duel. Things like that. Uh, but all in all, like, I I didn't have, like, huge gripes with the Observing in Season 1. But, you know, I'm not going to say, like, oh yeah, it was absolutely perfect. But, you know, in your mind, like... Where do you sit with this news? Because everyone else was just kind of, like, caught off guard. But, like, if you go on the, the Reddit, a as some people do, uh, Reddit was very nasty in regards to the comments uh, with these releases. Uh, oh, so here's the thing. I think Blizzard, or the Overwatch League in general, like, Imagine and Baker did a good job. They may, uh, like you said, it was not perfect, but they did a good job. I think the Overwatch League wants to take it to the next level. And I think that's what they're going to try and do. And by that, I mean, like, you have professional, like, you're talking, like, ESPN, NFL people. Like, those are the people that they kind of hire. And you hire a producer in the room and back saying, switch to this, switch to this, switch to this. You have, like, the one person doing all that. I think they want to go towards more of a professional sports appeal than an esports appeal. Um, and I think 
you nailed it right on the head of sometimes they spent too much time on the Pharaoh versus Pharaoh. Sometimes they spent too much time on Widowmaker. Mm -hmm. They spent a lot of time on Widowmaker. Uh, whereas, you know, in the more traditional sports set, you would probably spend the majority of the time on, let's say, the tank or someone like that that's right in the thick of things. So, so you get more of the, the fight feel to it. So I think they want to move more towards that direction. Um, I could see them come out with something saying they hired some producer from a traditional sports league or from ESPN or Fox Sports or NBC Sports, something like that, like a producer to come in and kind of run the stuff. This is nothing against Imagine and Baker because they did a great job and they worked very well with what they're doing. It's just they were thinking more on the esports like, this is what I want to see as an esports fan. And I think Overwatch League wants to go beyond the esports fan. They want to encapsulate all fans or any potential fans. And they know that uh, any non Overwatch fan is going to see this fair versus fair match and be like, okay, this is boring. Uh, whereas, like, fans like me and you, we, we don't mind fair versus fair. We know, like, the, the cat and mouse game that goes on there. But a lot of people just don't. So I think they want to go towards more someone who knows how to handle, you know, the more casual fan, the new fan, stuff like that. Make it more appealing to a broader audience. And I think that's where they're going. Okay. Uh, well, in regards to merchandise, we actually have uh, a new book that is coming out for the Overwatch League, uh, which is like kind of like a look back at the inaugural season. This book is being published by Prima. Uh, who published, like, a lot of, like, game and strategy guides and walkthroughs. And if you go on Amazon, you can actually pre it right now for $39.99. Uh, and this book is set to release on November 16th. So, you know, coming up pretty quick here. Uh, so what this book will, book will have is, like, a behind-the-scenes look. They'll have interviews. Uh, they'll have, like, featured coverage of, you know, the season champions, London Spitfire. We'll also have, like, highlights all the way throughout, uh, including, like, the All-Star Weekend. Uh, but really, like, what I want to know is, are they going to cover up any of uh, the bad press, so to speak? Because uh, there was quite a bit of spicy drama in the first season that they might want to uh, try to disregard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they'll cover things like the XQC. Because that's just, that's normal drama. That's mm -hmm. not anything that's detrimental to the league. It's more detrimental to the person. The Dreamcast first situation, on the other hand, mm -hmm. yeah, let's avoid that one altogether. Because uh, that's detrimental to the, the league. Anytime you have something like that. XQC being an a-hole. It, and his and his fan base being a group of a-holes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but you kind of are. Um, that's not detrimental to the league. That's like, honestly, that's like Conor McGregor. Like Conor McGregor is probably the biggest a-hole, and his fan base doesn't fall far behind. XQC falls into that category, but Conor McGregor is great for the USC. XQC is great for Overwatch. Mm -hmm. Great for publicity. Exactly. Dream Casper, horrible for everything all around. Like, everything. So, yeah, no. Don't talk about that kind of stuff. Bring up the, the other thing. Like, the XQC thing. Fine. Whatever. Nobody's going to be like, I'm not going to watch the Overwatch League because of the XQC situation. But people would get pissed about the Dream Casper situation. So don't bring that up whatsoever. But all the other things, I, yeah. I mean, this is something I'm going to buy. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt about it, me buying this. What, what, I, what I really hope for, though, is like maybe somewhere in this book, maybe they focus on like situations that you wouldn't have expected. Like, let's yeah. say, like, experimentations with tank lines, for instance, because, you know, this will bring it back to the whole XQC suspension. Uh, you know, we had moments like Taimu coming in to fill the main tank role. We also saw, you know, Ryuji Han for 
the Seoul Dynasty, uh, you know, playing a little bit of Winston as well. Like, I wonder if they're going to, like, highlight some of those more off-the-wall situations uh, that these teams had to, like, had to try to, like, deal with and just uh, roll with the punches, basically. Who was the who was the coach that, like, body-checked the some of the Houston outlaws? That was uh, D-Pay from the LA Gladiators. Yes. <laughs> that would be cool if that's in there. Be like... I was back there, and he just threw a shoulder into Jake. Mm -hmm. All right, this is awesome. <laughs> Let's get some interviews on this. See, that's the kind of stuff that I want in there. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that is not detrimental to the league. So it, it will be interesting. Yeah, like everything going on around the Dallas Fuel would be interesting to read about. Everything to go around um, New York Excelsior, the, the Gladiators, Fisher. All that stuff would be great to hear, like behind the scene interviews and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very excited for this book, and it's going to be out right around uh, the holiday season. So, I need to make a listener Christmas list to add. Ah, <laughs> uh, good luck with that. Yes. Uh, in you speaking speaking of things that you don't want, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff kind of like going on behind the scenes with not necessarily outlaws. But their parent organization. Uh, so first up, let's look at contenders right now. Not actual contenders, contenders trials. So still Path the Pro. Uh, so right now, contenders trials is underway for both North America and South America. And GG Esports Academy, which is the academy team for the Houston Outlaws, have had to drop out of contenders trials North America. <laughs> due to uh, not submitting a roster before the league's deadline. So as a result, all the North American Trials teams are going to be receiving a free win. And all of this was just due to the fact that this organization was unable to give out contracts to potential players due to a hiring freeze that was from their parent organization, Infinite Esports and Entertainment. Now, there's already been, like, a slew of staff changes at Infinite uh, that led to uh, this temporary suspension of subsidiary groups operating under the Infinite banner. And GG Esports Academy had got, you know, relegated to trials after they failed to qualify for the playoffs in last season of Contenders NA. That was the second time that's actually happened, the first one being the British Hurricane. And, uh, you know, you can thank last night's leftovers uh, for GGEA kind of falling off the map. Uh, but In specific one person, who would that be, Totem? Um, sugar Free. Ah, you know, sugar the, free. the person, the person, <laughs> mind you, uh, who this organization tried to handcuff to a five-year contract, <laughs> which in itself, it, it, you, no. We're going to give you a five-year contract that you can one year in the overwatch league in. he he needs to get an agent and he needs to get right? one soon uh but anyways so you know this news basically came after uh some recent reports that gg esports academy were targets of vod sharing in the tier 2 scene and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that and how it's, you know, probably not as uh, uncommon as many people would, would believe. Because, you mm -hmm. know, if there's something to gain, you're always going to have people that are going to be shady, try to take shortcuts, you know, try to get ahead. Uh, and, you know, like that, like, that team specifically wasn't the one who pointed it out, but it was, like, some of the other Path to Pro players that were. Uh, but regardless, like, GGEA... Uh, were sent to trials, and now they're just, they're not there. <laughs> uh, so, who knows what's exactly going to happen, but, like, to not submit a roster in time? Like, it's not a, not a good look for the Path to Pro scene. No, it's a pretty god-awful look for the, the Tier 2 scene. Because... <laughs> I don't know what's going on behind the lines with Wars Optic, whatever you want to call them, but to not be able to put together a roster because you're in such financial shape that you can't afford to, you need to cut money so you can't sign tier two talent. Like, what? Like, no. Like, everything you hear out of the Overwatch League is how 
much more profitable the Overwatch League has been than everyone's projections. That's why in Season 2, you saw the price of teams go up and up and up by a significant amount. I don't know what's going on. The, I mean, the Outlaws need to have a Tier 2 team. Like, the way things are built now, you have to have a, a Tier 2 team. It's the, the contracts for the Overwatch League are kind of not based around having, you know, an affiliate team. But you get so your team is so much better off by having that because you can have the two way players. Now take all of that, throw that out the window for the Outlaws, a team who is probably one of the the fan favorites in all of the Overwatch League, and you're just handcuffing them even more. And the only thing you've done is you get you brought in Dante, mm-hmm. like you brought in Dante and you got rid of your entire tier two team. Like, who had, granted, they lost to LNL, got knocked out. They had some decent talent on, on the GGEA team. It's it's just, it's baffling to me that they would do this. And like you said, there were some other changes. Kai Kai got let go due to all this. Uh, although I do think Kai Kai is going to be a coach somewhere else. I, I mean, I would almost put money on that. He's either going to be a head coach or an assistant coach somewhere else. Um, he's too good of a, a coach in a in a league that needs coaches for them not for a team not to bring him in. It's just it, you can't be a penny pinching organization after year one. You can't go in thinking, okay, this is going to be a massive money maker for us. And we are banking on that in year one. You can't do that with any business outside of esports. You can't do that with any business. So for for them to come in and do this, it's just how does a player trust the organization at this point? Like, what if they were? Let's say they bring in GGEA tier for the next season for tier two. What player is going to be like? I trust this organization to stay afloat and not get rid of me in six months. Mm-hmm. Like you just won't, you won't get quality talent because most of the quality talent you're going to get is going to probably sign with someone else. So they don't have to deal with your drama. So I, this is just bad for the organization all around. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, for, for Kai Kai, like this was a coach that had basically been turning down uh, some other opportunities so he could remain loyal to this organization. Uh, but you know, now he is a free agent because of this. And, you know, this is someone that has a very tenured uh, career when it comes mm-hmm. to coaching. You know, he was with Envious, uh before he was with uh, the Dallas Fuel, uh, you know, in the honor- inaugural season. Later joined with the Outlaws back in May. And, you know, like, when you look at Infinite, like, this is basically affecting a lot of that. And I don't know, like, if there's been other releases since then, but I know Optic uh, had let their... Uh, well, their League of Legends, like, general manager resigned from his position. You also had uh, the Infinite Director of International Development leaving the company as well. Uh, so right now it kind of seems like it's uh, a bit of a revolving door. And, you know, it- it's hard to say, like, how much of this is actually going to affect the Outlaws per se. But, you know, Kai Kai was one casualty. And, you know, it- it- it's hard to say if there's going to be more. Uh, but right now, like, I don't feel like it's necessarily, like, time to hit the panic button if you are on the Outlaws or if you're a fan of the Outlaws. But regardless, like, you hate to see some of the pieces kind of around them uh, starting to crumble. One thing I will add after, like, clicking links and reading an article, actually. So Jacob Wolf over at ESPN, who is the esports writer for ESPN, mm-hmm. highly recommend you reading his articles. So one thing that Infinite Esports did is they cut ties with one of their investors. Okay. So Deep Space Ventures, uh, after the company's managing partner was arrested for domestic violence. Now, nobody will confirm that the this happened right before they had to go on a hiring freeze. No one will confirm that this is because of that, like they lose the capital, they have to go on a hiring freeze. So, but it's highly implicated. So this may not even be like, 
let, let's hold off the the, the pitchforks and, <laughs> and and you know lighting them on fire because gotten rid of it, uh, uh, an investing investing partner I mean, for good reason. Who who needs pitchforks when you have barbed wire baseball bats? Yeah, and uh, a Casey Jones mask. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, all right. So if they if this is the reason, I can kind of see it. If you lose the capital of somebody, one of your major investors, because they did, they got arrested for domestic violence. Like, okay, then I could say it. But it, again, it's not confirmed. If that is confirmed, I'll give Infinite Esports a pass. I will. But that's the only way I'm giving them a pass. So, who knows? Only time will tell, and I doubt we'll actually get the the full story at any point yeah definitely uh but that, that's pretty much everything that's going on on the overwatch league side of things so let's talk a little bit about the patch that dropped on tuesday for this week's main discussion so we got patch 1.29 uh that hit on live servers yesterday that would be tuesday so with that we got the new the the new air quotes seasonal event Halloween mm-hmm. Terror. Uh, we got updates to the colorblind options. We got the Torbjorn rework. We got other balance updates. And, you know, a few other things. So, you know, we, we already kind of, like, touched up on this stuff. And I just want to note, you know, our dev and savior, Papa Jeffy Cap Cap, praise him. Praise him. During the developer update, he, he basically said, like, uh, don't expect all of this stuff to go to live, right? And what Doesn't it, he say that every time? He, he's... Every time he's when he mentions this, and I'm like, "Yeah, okay, okay, Dad. Let we'll we'll see." And sure enough, everything went straight to live. I mean, sometimes you know, <laughs> uh, a, a parent has to lie to its children for their own. For, for their, <laughs> yeah, okay. And this is what Papa Jeffy Cap Cap is doing to us. He's like, "I'm gonna lie to you, but I know you know I'm lying, but I'm just kind of covering my." So kind of like what he did when he when they were talking about like the third social feature. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's coming, and oh, we we pushed it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we pushed it back because they'll probably come out with another social feature years down the road, and be like, "See, told you it'd be coming." Mm-hmm. Just didn't say when. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so just a patch overview, guys. We have some updated visuals uh, for, like, shields and barriers uh, to just, like, improve the readability. Uh, we have, in regards to balance updates, Brigitte's shield health was reduced from 600 to 500. And Doomfist had his hand cannon damage fall off, uh, now starting at 15 meters. We got the McCree combat roll cooldown reduced from 8 seconds to 6 seconds. Uh, we had Farah with, like, a slew of changes, uh, which basically uh, lowered the cooldown of her Concussive Blast from 12 seconds to 9 seconds. She got an attack speed increase. Uh, they lowered the recovery time between her shots. They redistributed her damage between explosions and impact damage. They also increased her self-knockback, uh, while also decreasing the explosion knockback. Uh, I know for me, they also uh, made her Blizzard more readable, so now it's in, like, a dome shape. So, you know, if you're, like, on a low ground and, you know, she puts it on, like, a platform or something, you can very easily tell whether or not you're going to be affected by the Blizzard rather than just being, like, Is something hidden me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then getting frozen What's and then you on? die. Uh, uh, with Arissa. They looked at her fu- fusion driver, so her you know her primary fire. Uh, they reduce her maximum spread by twenty percent, so you know a little bit more precise uh, with her aiming, which is great to see. Uh, we have Soldier seventy six uh, with his heavy pulse rifle. They increased uh, the number of shots until he reaches maximum spread, so it goes from six bullets to nine bullets, which is pretty substantial. Like. I, I'm really curious to see where exactly Soldier is going to fit right now, because when you look at him now, like, he definitely has more ability to finish off kills, because he will have more precise aim because of this spread, which I'm excited to see. Uh, but, Ed, you know, the big thing, obviously, is 
the new rework for Torbjorn, and, you know, there's a lot of changes with the new Torb, so what exactly did they do to, uh, the Swede in this case? All right, so we'll start off. General, they reduced the size of Torbjorn's head hit volume by 10%. Um, that's the most basic of the changes they did. Uh, so let's go to his, his, his main gun. Let's get this small stuff out of the way. So his rivet gun. The primary fire... Uh, projectile speed was increased from 60 to 70 per second. Reload time was reduced from 2.2 seconds to 2 seconds. And this is actually cool. Uh, Turret targets enemy hit by primary fire. So whatever you're shooting at, Torbjorn's turret will also shoot at. Uh, that is something that I think Symmetra could definitely benefit from. But that's for a whole other story. Uh, and then for the alternate fire... The recovery lowered from 0.8 to 0.6 seconds. Damage per shot lowered from 150 to 125. Reload time was reduced from 2.2 to 2 seconds. And the spread randomization was readjusted. So they basically made minor changes um, to, to his primary fire. Uh, nothing crazy drastic, but just overall improvements. Um, his Forge Hammer got a buff, so Mangachu should be happy as hell. Uh, his radi The radius of the Forge Hammer increased to align with Quick Melee, so you'll hit more people. Now, the big changes. So, we'll start with the turret. So, you have the Deploy Turret. Uh, the turret is now a thrown projectile. Uh, I compare it to kind of like a Tracer Bomb. So, you can Kobe... Yeah, you can Kobe... Uh, your turret now to different locations, which is kind of cool. It automatically builds over three seconds. Uh, gone are the days of like level one, level two, and if you remember, level three. Um, so it's just automatically going to be essentially a level two turret, no matter what, when it's built after those three seconds. The health was actually reduced from 300 to 250, so it's easier to kill. And then it now incurs a five-second cooldown when deployed. So you can't throw one down as a distraction and throw one down in another area and kind of do the same thing. So there's a five-second cooldown between you when you can launch a turret. Um, there is a 10-second cooldown when destroyed in combat. So, like, if the turret is killed, you can't drop one for 10 seconds. Um, so that's nice. You can kill it. You know, you're not going to have to deal with it. Uh, essentially, you'll essentially it's a 13 second delay because it takes three seconds for the turret to build. Um, you will uh, no longer be able to deploy a new turret if it's in combat. So when the turret's firing, if they're pushing and they're killing it, you can't throw down another turret because that one's being killed. You have to wait for it to die for it to shoot which is nice. Um, it can be now be destroyed using the interact input. I guess I haven't really tested that out, so I don't really know I, what that's about. I would imagine that would also incur the the like silence effect of being able to rebuild. Because hmm. hmm. it technically is being destroyed. Okay. And then lastly, it completes the self-building once deployed, even if toward eliminated so if they kill you in the three seconds before it's built it will still build mm -hmm. um so that's the changes to that now we have a new ability that's an old ability nerfed <laughs> so gone is armor packs no more armor packs are given um it is replaced with overload which is essentially the old molten core but but nerfed it lasts for five seconds the cooldown is 12 seconds you gain 150 armor and your increase it increases attack movement speed and reload speed by 30 percent so you hit this new you know new e ability you gain armor you attack quicker you move quicker you reload quicker uh and it but it only lasts five seconds so it's like a mini molten core mini old molten core um the new ultimate is called molten core so they just wanted to keep the name. And so this switches the weapon to the rivet gum to his claw arm. Like it switches from that. 
It lasts six seconds. And what you essentially do is you fire, I think it's up to 10, like, blobs. I think the best way to do, describe it is, like, blobs that create damage pools where they land for 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, one thing to note, the globus, uh, globals bounce off walls and ceilings until they hit the ground. So you can shoot them up in the air and the 10 seconds for how long they last will not start until they hit the ground. So no matter what, it has to hit the ground. The base damage of each one of these when somebody goes on top of it is 130. Okay. The damage, though, this is where it gets interesting because it's a nerf to everyone's favorite baguette hero. The damage increases from 30 to 190 against enemies with armor. So the ones with armor are non baguette ultimates is Bastion. I don't see that being an issue. Baguette, Diva, Orissa, Reinhardt, Torbjorn, Winston, Wrecking Ball. So this is anti baguette, anti tank. It, it really is because those are the ones who generally have the armor. Now I think one on there that's missed is Zenyatta. Because doesn't Zenyatta isn't Zenyatta half armor? I don't double check, but I'm pretty sure yeah. Uh, but basically, yeah. like it, it's it's interesting. Like you like as we mentioned in the past when we were covering the PTR. No, it's basically Torbjorn is. Uh, like, this is another parent that counters her kid. Same with, you know, Anna and Farah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, there hasn't been a new patch since Brigitte has come out that they haven't nerfed her. Mm-hmm. Like, and then this patch, they nerfed her twice. Because, like, you know, they nerfed her shield from 600 to 500 health. And then they introduce an ultimate that counters literally everything that she does. Um, you know, so it's it's going to be interesting. I, I don't know if this means Torbjorn's meta. I don't think he is. I, I just don't. I, I, I don't think turrets are going to be meta really ever from the higher levels. Because turrets can be easily defeated. So you you take the turret out of the equation here, because that can be avoided, changed, all that stuff. Is the hero itself special enough that it it requires to be picked? And I don't think so. Uh, it may it may have an adverse effect because like Brigette counters Genji and Tracer. And it's not the fact that people are on her that people don't play Tracer and Genji. It's the the fear of them switching to her that people don't play Tracer and Genji. And I think this could do something similar. The fear of having a Torbjorn on the other team makes people not choose her. Uh, and it's it's the same effect. And I think everyone agrees games would probably be better off if there was less of her because she's a little... She's the easiest character to climb with the hands down. It's it's not even close. Um, so the less of her you see, the better. Um, so I don't know. What do you think this is gonna make Tori be viable? It, it's really early to tell. Um for for me, like I, I could definitely see it like maybe this will be uh like the counter pick to like the goats compositions, you know, the triple tank, triple support. Uh, if they didn't buff soldier and like you know some of the hit scan, then you you know you might be able to argue it. But you know it's just it it's so hard to say. Like I I definitely don't think it's going to like make people shy away from playing Torbjorn in competitive. Like if anything, you know he mm-hmm. might see some more benefit. Uh, more so on attack because uh, he is going to be more viable on attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I feel like uh, in regards to the overload mechanic, uh, you know, maybe Torbjorn is going to kind of like transition to like a zone denial type role, similar to what, you know, May currently fits right now. Uh, so this would like 
I mean, I guess in a sense too, it's kind of like what Wrecking Ball is into with his uh, with his minefield. Uh, so like I can imagine him getting played on like Nepal, like in the in the shrine where you know you could easily like uh, basically like wall off like one of the entry points, you know, something like that. Uh, but if you're worried about how he's going to do in the new event, you you don't have to worry. We'll we'll talk about that. Uh, you do not. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's pretty ridiculous. Uh, but. You know, other than that, you know, there were a couple minor changes, like, uh, lowering the setup timer for Assault, Escort, and Hybrid maps from, like, uh, like, 1 minute to 45 seconds. Uh, they, like, increase the Assemble Your Team timer, uh, from 10 seconds to 25 seconds during the second round on Assault, Hybrid, and Escort maps. But, like, if we're talking about this patch, we, we gotta talk about something that happened because of this patch in regards to a bug. And this is actually something that I, uh, I had an issue with earlier today when I was queuing for Junkenstein. Uh, and this is a pretty big bug. And I don't know if you've had this happen, Ed. But I was playing with one of our listeners, Young Flame, And I got into the game, and I had no control over my character at all. So, <laughs> what this game-breaking bug is, uh, basically... There's a chance that the main menu UI, when you load into a game, will be laid over the hero select when you join into the game. And that bug prevents players from controlling their character or just really using like any sort of keybinds, uh, which would result in the player being kicked from the game for appearing to be AFK. And this is a pretty big deal because, you know, when we talk about competitive... They're not going to know if it's due to a bug or you just being AFK, so a punishment can occur. So, it's important to note, like, this bug has not been fixed yet. This can happen. I know... I know I was, like, browsing the hero gallery, like, while I was waiting for the queue to pop, and then the bug happened. So, it's not like I was just sitting on the main menu at the time, but it, it still had, like, the main menu UI with said bug. Uh, when I wasn't able to control my character. So just a PSA for anyone out there. There's a very bad bug, uh, which could potentially kick you out of a game or cause you to lose SR if you're, you know, going into competitive and then this hits you. So uh, be weary of it, and hopefully this will get patched really quick uh, in regards to a hot fix. But, you know, it seems like anytime they patch something, there's uh, something going around. De it's, I mean, this is something that's definitely going to be fixed rather soon. Um, because obviously people are going to freak out if they start losing SR bug in a game like this. Mm -hmm. Something as simple. So, yeah, it'll be fixed soon. I have not done um, One thing I did want to ask you about the patch notes. Because this is probably the only time I've had this come up. Farah, she got some changes. You went over them. Right. Buff or nerf? In regards to what? <laughs> Her overall, because like it's it seems half the people think it's a it's, these changes are buff. Half okay. the people think these changes are nerf. I happen to be in the for the majority of the player base. This is a nerf, and it seems like it's a pretty big nerf for the majority of the player base. Okay, so as someone that plays a ton of Pharah, when it comes to air to air, I consider it to be a buff. Outside of that, I I, I feel like it's it's gonna be a nerf. Um, but like it, it's still really early on. Like I haven't really played a ton of Pharah in competitive. Uh, but my early indication is leaning towards it being more of a nerf, just because you're not always going to be spamming, so you're not going to get the full use out of the rate of fire changes that she had in this patch. Uh, so overall, like, your damage based on that should be lower, because you're not just constantly spamming all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's my stance on it, but, you know, I still need a little bit more playtime uh, with her changes, but my gut feeling is it will be a nerf overall. Um, yeah, I was, uh, like, uh, Tailspin tweeted out, he's like, I can't believe, believe this is a nerf, uh, once it's live, I'll show you all that it's a buff, and I'm like, no, 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 see, that's not the thing, with your aim, it's a buff, mm -hmm. 
you are in the top 1%. <laughs> mm-hmm. The other 99% can't aim as well as with Farah. And if you can't aim as well as Tailspin does with Farah, it's a nerf. Because you lose splash damage. Overall, it will be a nerf. And that's my feeling on it. Is And I think even uh, Papa said that like this is going to be a, a nerf. Like, for high-level players, this is going to be a, a pretty big buff for them. But for the rest, it's going to be kind of a nerf. Like, he, he kind of alluded to that. Like, it will have... You'll be doing less damage mm-hmm. at the lower levels because you'll lose all the splash damage. So, yeah, I I just think it's a nerf. It's just it's one of those things. I've never seen a hero change that's so divided mm-hmm. on is it a nerf or is it a buff, and nobody can kind of come to a consensus. Uh, so it, it's just one of those weird changes where it affects everyone differently. Yeah, so, like, if you're in a position where you're consistently hidden direct hits, then, yeah, like, this could definitely be a buff. But, like, it, it's hard to tell, like, at what point, like, it would lean towards that side. Like, because usually, like, I don't know, like, I'm trying to think, like, what my average would be with direct hits, because it kind of varies. But, like, let's say, like, on average, like, I'm hitting, like, 40 to 60%. You know, 60% being high end, uh, which... I would say, like, most games are probably around, like, 52 to 54. So, I feel like because it's higher than, you know, 50%, then it might be, you know, an overall buff. But, like, it's hard to tell, like, how substantial that would actually be in terms of overall damage. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to do some more tests in, uh, in whatever game mode, really. Something uh, or another. Or, yeah. Maybe, uh... Drunkenstein, for that matter. <laughs> well, yeah, you can go on her. I'll go on Widow. Win-win. Yeah, we, we could do Spider that. Spider can be on on Hamster, and, you know, mm-hmm. things just go swimmingly. Absolutely. Uh, well, let, let's talk about the event, because obviously that was, like, the meat and the potatoes of patch 1.29, and we have a ton of new unlockables and cosmetics in the game for the halloween terror event so you know as per usual event skins in regards to the legendaries will run you 3,000 credits uh any prior halloween skin will be marked down at a discounted price and you know new skin wise we have uh like six new legendary skins we have three new epic skins so you know we got doomfish uh we got the swamp monster doomfist we have the banshee moira uh we have the Enchanted Armor Farah, which, you know, there was always a question of, well, can she be headshot? Yes, yes, she can. Uh, but what's cool about this set, I don't know if you've actually seen this. Oh, yeah, I with, know exactly where you're going. With this, <laughs> with this, this is my favorite thing uh, in this patch in regards to the new stuff. So when you die with this skin on, with the Enchanted Armor Farah, she, like, her armor, like, crumbles, basically, and it... Like, you just see multiple armor pieces, like, laying on the ground when you die. And, like, it's little things like that that really just tie everything together, like, with that neat little bow. Like, kudos to, like, the animators for, like, throwing these, like, small, uh, small things that the fans can appreciate. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No, that was awesome. That cool little... And, I mean, yeah. There, they... This is probably the best single event I've ever seen blizzard come out with for skins and that hurts me to say because i despise Halloween. <laughs> like but this is like there are only three skins that i'm just kind of like meh on and i mean that's sombra and i will never like a sombra skin because again <laughs> for like the fourth week in a row you're giving an invisible character a special skin Let's skip beyond that. The the May skin did not like the May skin, mm-hmm. and the Widowmaker skin is just kind of meh. Mm-hmm. But the one that they didn't show is my favorite. Oh yeah. So yeah, the the slasher seventy six, mm-hmm. like the Jason inspired. Yeah, you like, know the the Jason, the Jason inspired. It's it's like it's one of those things where his weapon, the top of his weapon, is like a chainsaw, which is not Jason. You know, <laughs> but it's it's a cool little feature that they that they added to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, 
the the McCree one is weird because his like I know he's wearing like a scarf or whatever over his face, but it just looks crazy fake. Uh, but I still like it. You know, the I think everyone's favorite is the hamster one. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's rightfully so. Now, did you see what he shoots? Yeah. He it, shoots packets of gum. It's the greatest scene. <laughs> like, and not only did they give him the jack-o'-lantern, kid, which I think a lot of people kind of doomed you get because it's just, it's perfect. It's like a match made in heaven. But then they made him like a demon hamster, and it's very creepy. And But then he has the same emotes. And it's just like, okay, no. It's like watching a horror movie where they have, like, small children, and you're like, nope, nope, I'm out. Small children are, like, the scariest thing ever in horror movies. I don't care what movie it is. There's small <laughs> children. I'm out. And that's what Hammond looks like. It's like, nope, I'm out. I don't, I don't want to ever see this. I'm good. So, but that's the point of the skin. So it's it's probably the best out of the bunch. I mean, Slasher is my favorite, but the Hammond one is probably the best one that they've made in probably a year. Like I can't think of a a, a more recent, like a, a more recent holiday skin that is as good as that. Mm-hmm. I think the last ones were probably, and again, this is me. Some of the Christmas ones. Like the road hog, like the reindeer. That one's awesome. Right. The nutcracker, which we've talked that, about. The awesome. scariest skin in all of Overwatch. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but like, this is the only time where I've been like, I want six, seven of these skins. Like, I legit want, like, I might buy boxes mm-hmm. to just get these skins. And I've never been like that for any other event outside of the Christmas. Right. So uh, I I haven't gotten anything outside of the Wrecking Ball skin, uh, which is my favorite one out of the lot. Uh, but, like, I haven't seen anyone posting about the Banshee Morga, so I don't know if she screams all of her voice lines. Uh, so I'm hoping it's going to be the case, but, like, I'm not going to hold my breath. Uh, but all in all, like... Like, I, I really like basically everything except the Epic skins. Like, I'm not super crazy about the, the Spider Widowmaker. And yeah, like, I know, like, that's that's her theme. But, like, they basically, like, just, like, made her Spider lines, like, stuff, darker yeah. and, like, more refined. That yeah. that was basically it. Like, there wasn't a whole lot to, uh, to like, really enjoy in regards uh, to that skin. Uh, the Undead McCree one is probably the better one out of the Epic ones. And, you know, it has, like, uh, for his belt... Instead of, you know, B-A-M-F, it's D-A-M-F. So, you know, he's he's a dead ass. Uh, but, like, <laughs> I, I'm sure, like, uh, you know, Reddit is just going to, you know, call the new McCree Bone Daddy. Because, you know, it, it would just make too much sense uh, for mm-hmm. this case. Uh, but the the May one, like, I liked what they kind of did with, like, the, the drone cylinder. But, like, the other aspects of the skin, I wasn't, like, too crazy about. But all in all, like, the legendary skins were fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. really the only one that I was kind of, like, meh about was the somber one. Uh, I just, I don't know if it was necessarily because it wasn't the character that I wanted, or if it's just that, you know, it's, there's only so much you can do with the design, like, you know, the bride, essentially. Uh, so I, I felt like that kind of handcuffed, uh, the creative direction, uh, that they could have had with a character like that. But, you know, we have a ton of other cosmetics with this patch you know we got victory poses uh which for the most part are like the heroes holding pumpkins in their hands you know doomfist is kind of like doing like like the double fist and like trying to smash it basically Mm -hmm. uh we have uh there's a hammond one where he's basically like gnawing on the top of a pumpkin we have a really cool new emote for bastion where he basically is a zombie and what i love about this is that in the emote you know, Ganymede is with you, and Ganymede is also reanimated. And when he starts to trail behind Bastion, then he starts to, like, fly like normal. But, like, that's just not something that I would have expected them to kind of add as, like, an additional, you know, uh, like, art animation, basically, for that. Uh, we got 
you know, a couple new Highland intros. There's one with Brigitte, where, you know, she does her shield bash. Uh, Winston basically, like, does a light-up uh, jack-o'-lantern with uh, some of his tech. And, you know, we got a ton of new trick-or-treat voice lines. We got some new sprays. And I have to say, like, the new sprays this year, I actually really enjoy. A lot of the new sprays are tied into the new skins, which I didn't expect either. So, all in all, like, from top to bottom, like, there really wasn't a lot of stuff that I just kind of, like, rolled my eyes over. And a lot of this stuff would be stuff that I would want to try to get. Yeah, no, like, like I said, they knocked it out of the in every aspect of this this event with all of it from the sprays to the skins now we can only hope that they take this momentum forward <laughs> to the next event mm -hmm. in the christmas one so come on blizzard <laughs> fingers crossed for your sake and if they oh, drop yeah, the ball yeah. if they drop the ball i'm never going to hear the end of it no you won't <laughs> cuz like uh like my main account, not the account I play the most now, because I play the most on my alt account that, you know, Hondo, uh, but, like, my Edna account, like, has every Christmas skin imaginable, and all my characters still wear the Christmas skins year-round. Right. And I'm okay with this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, love it. So, you know, we have the return of Drunken Science Revenge as a brawl. And, you know, I just want to note, like, what sort of changes there are to the event this year that weren't in last year. And I'll be honest, like, there, there's not a whole lot different uh, from what it was last year. There, there are a couple of new additions in regards to the heroes. Uh, so you can now play as Tracer and Brigitte. Uh, so, like... Tracer is kind of, kind of, kind of meh in this mode. Like, uh, the, the pulse bomb, like, in regards to the ultimates, when you compare it to the other DPS, pulse bomb just doesn't stack up to, like, tactical visor or, you know, dead eye. You know, a lot of people are playing soldier and McCree in this mode for the mm -hmm. DPS. A lot of people are playing Torbjorn. For different reasons. Uh, so Tracer kind of falls behind in those aspects. And, you know, Brigitte, she she's not that bad. Like, she can definitely solo heal and, like, solo clear one of the lanes. Uh, I haven't tried healing with her in regards to, like, higher difficulties. I feel like at that point she might fall a little bit behind, you know, Anna and Zenyatta. Uh, but she, she does fine in, like, normal. I haven't tested it outside of that, so uh, just keep that in mind. So, in regards to, uh, like, the bosses, for instance, you know, last year we had a different iteration of Symmetra. So, the difference between last year and this year is that, you know, you don't have to deal with the, the shield generator. Now you have to deal with her photon barrier. So, when she uses her ultimate, she'll try to cut the map in half. So, just be wary of that because, you know, those rip tires will start to come out, you know, from whatever side of the map, and you're not going to be able to hit it if you're, you know, in the back there. Uh, so outside of that, you know, in regards to, like, balance tweaks since last year, you know, obviously, you know, Mercy recently had her healing throughput uh, nerfed a little bit. Uh, you know, I know there's been a couple of Junkrat changes, so all in all, like, like, the event this year, based off of what we have seen, does feel easier than what it was last year. Uh, mm -hmm. But that being said, you know, we also haven't really been pushing Endless as of yet on, like, Legendary Difficulty or anything like that. But, like, regardless of what sort of compositions we've been running or if we try to meme it up with our comps, like, when it comes to getting our loot boxes and wins, we've had no issues so far. No, no. I mean, I even tried to... Th so, like... The thing is, is if you have a Brigette and you have, and you're doing, like, on normal, if you have a Brigette and you have a Torbjorn, does not matter if you have two other people. It really doesn't. Like, those two just can carry an entire team. Um, I think, yeah, because I, I went Widowmaker when we had that. And mm -hmm. Widowmaker is not that good on this. Yeah, except for, um, like, clearing out the, uh, the bombardiers or whatever the heck they're called. Yep, yep, the elites, and they and good at taking Stein himself mm -hmm. because she can get a lot of good headshots in. 
because he doesn't have a whole lot of health. So, like, he's good in that aspect, but as far as, like, clearing all the mobs and stuff like that, trash tier. A useless ultimate. Like, just overall the worst character to select. And I went on it, and then we cleared it without any damage being done to the... Like, it was just that easy. Um, the You could tell the changes to Mercy... The Symmetra changes, I, I mean, I guess I never really thought that they'd change her ultimate because it was the shield barrier, or the shield generator, and now it's the barrier. Mm-hmm. I, I like the barrier a little better because it's just less annoying. All you have to do is be on one side of the barrier and then it doesn't right. matter. Um, I mean, you did fine as Tracer because you were using your um, recall almost to heal yourself. Mm-hmm. So I had to concentrate on you less. Like, there's a lot of little things like you can do, but overall, it feels a lot easier. McCree is still very, very good on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, very good. Like I, McCree, soldier, right in my mind on this. Now, once you push higher up, self heal. But like, yeah, McCree is amazing on this. Um. Torbjorn is amazing on this just because having a turret set up by the door to take care of any Omnics that might slip through. So, yeah. It's it's still fun. You know, it's, it's very easy to get your nine arcade wins because all you have to do is go into normal and it's a cakewalk. Like, we had somebody... We had our Torbjorn leave in one of our matches. <laughs> we did. <laughs> and we still easily cleared it with mm-hmm. three people so yeah it's if you do normal unless you're it's unless you have three people drop yeah unless everyone gonna, experiences the game break and bug <laughs> yeah you're gonna win you're just going to so yeah no it was it was it's fun still uh i haven't we have not done the unlimited or the any heroes one because when we get to any heroes i imagine bastion's quite popular um so, yeah, it will be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, like, really the only other thing of note that I kind of noticed was when I was facing Symmetra earlier, um, when I was on McCree, you know, I was I was on, like, the left-hand side, you know, getting that wave, and she definitely moves around a lot more than what I remember from last She drops year. down. She didn't do that before. Well, she does that, She's, too. Well, she, like, she used to just, like, slow walk down and come down the stairs Mm -hmm. there now she's like she's moving quick she's dropping down off the balcony and you're just like what is going on here Mm -hmm. like yeah so i noticed that too um one other thing that you actually pointed out is if you are a brigette and you have the junk tire you can actually you can't shield dash it but you can uh, what is her ability whiplash Whip you shot. can whip la- whip <laughs> shot, whiplash, whip shot the uh, the tire too, mm-hmm. so that al- also helps. Yeah, um, it do- it does a knockback. I mean, you could still shield bash. You just won't actually stun the tire. Yeah, uh, just do the damage to it that a normal shield bash would. So yeah, but that being said, like obviously you know, Dragon Sign Revenge is like one of the key things uh, with the brawl. Uh, so in regards to like any sort of tips, um. If you guys are focusing on endless, um, you know, when you get to the higher levels, in regards to team compositions, I would definitely recommend running Anna, Zenyatta, McCree, and Torbjorn uh, for your four heroes. Um, Torbjorn, I would say, is mandatory <laughs> uh, oh, at 100%. this point. And th- there's, there's a primary reason for that, regardless of what iteration of Torbjorn it is in its current state. Basically, with Torbjorn... Uh, at times you basically have, like, the ability to clear two different waves just due to his, uh, his new ultimate, you know, the Lava Cum, you know, you can just put it on one of the doorways, you can deal with another one, and, you know, uh, you can have your turret, but, like, Torbjorn, like, you can just put it in, like, anywhere on the map and then just not have to really worry about it until, uh, you know, you get, like, like, a big group of mobs, basically. Like, the turret does a lot of the cleanup, and there's been a lot of times where, you know, we've played, and a Torbjorn player, uh, you know, at times is gonna, like, one and a half, at times even double the amount of kills that we're getting on the other DPS heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, with Torbjorn, like, 
he just outputs more damage and gets more kills than the other heroes. That's not to say that I haven't had games where I've done more work with a McCree or a soldier. Mostly McCree, though, because uh, that hasn't been the case. But Torb is uh, by far the one that seems to be put it in the most work overall. Oh, yeah, 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 100%. In, in regards to, like, hero abilities, like, if you're a soldier, like, with your visor, prioritize cleaning up the, the ads as opposed to just using it on the boss. Because, uh, you know, there's going to be times where, you know, you're, you're going to fall behind a little bit and you don't want to risk the door taking any of the damage. You know, Anna, of course, you know, you can interrupt the ultimates. Uh, using your sleep dart, a lot of people like to sleep dart the Reaper whenever he spawns. Uh, you can also, you know, use your Bionade on the Reaper. Same with the Roadhog. Uh, but nano targets, you know, McCree is probably the best one. Unless, I'd say, like, you have to do a lot of ad cleanup. So at that point, you know, it might be better to prioritize the soldier for the Grand Magoggles. Uh, and other than that, like, Brigitte, you know, obviously shield... Uh, like, shield bash and stun the bosses as often as possible. And, you know, just help clear the doorways with your flail, because uh, you can hit basically both of the doorways if you're in the middle at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. So, all in all, like, the Zenyatta, like, for me, paired with Anna, is probably the best, uh, like, one-two punch with the supports, just because, you know, having that extra, uh, you know, debuff on targets definitely helps clean up the elites and the bosses and you know Zenyatta's can keep up with uh, some of the DPS characters as well. Yeah, no, you were I remember you were cleaning up on Zenyatta. Well. That was uh, you were you were trash talking. That was until about we got like halfway through it and then the other and damage we, finally we, caught up. I was like, "Oh, it's about we, time." And then we smoked you. Um so yeah. Deal with that. But no, Zenyatta is perfect. Um, you know, it's they can pump out heals when need be, and they can pump out as much damage as most people can on a regular basis. So Zenyatta, Anna, if you're pushing some of these infinite ones, Anna's mandatory for the um, the Roadhog, so he can't heal. <laughs> so yeah, I'd say those two are mandatory. Torbjorn, mandatory. And it's literally a coin flip, like, whether you are more comfortable with McCree or Soldier. But I don't think there's any variation from those five choices that you can make that makes sense. Yeah, for me, like, I would definitely recommend McCree more so than 76. Oh, um, yeah, I would too. It's just, if you're, if you're a crap McCree, mm -hmm. Soldier is the only suitable replacement. Yeah. Um, whereas the other characters don't have a suit place. Yeah, it, I mean, for me, it's just more, uh, when you look at the damage output, Soldier, even with the changes, still tends to fall behind McCree. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, hands down he does. It's just, some people really can't play McCree. Mm -hmm. So... This is true, and, you know, when I was facing Symmetra, I definitely didn't feel like I could play McCree because she was so sporadic with her movement. Like, I apologized to Yunflame when I was playing with her. I'm like, man, I could not hit this bitch, like, at all. <laughs> hey, hey, mark that down. What, t what time is it? I have to put that down. Totally uh -huh. scared. I don't care. Yep. Yes. That wouldn't be the first, <laughs> uh, first fragrant, fragrant foul that I've done tonight, for that matter. Uh... True. But anyways, you know, that's basically everything that dropped on Tuesday with the new patch, with the new event. So, you know, a little bit of changes, uh, you know, some uh, some new heroes entering the fold with the event. Got some awesome cosmetics, so definitely hop on, play Junkin' Science Revenge. Tell us how easy it is, and uh, I I'm really curious to see, like, how many Torbjorns are just gonna, like, AFK and just let their turrets do the work, since, you know, they're the ones getting all the kills anyway. Wait, that's an option? Do I should have noted. <laughs> You're not doing that. Ah, uh, fine. I'll just go on Widow. I mean, I'm so used to doing all the work anyway, based off of the Widow game. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no, I did, I did nothing. I didn't even get a medal for Man. kills or damage. So. That, that's what happens when you play a sniper in that mode. 
Mm-hmm. I don't even feel bad. Yeah, I mean, so Widow wasn't that good at it last year. Really not any better this year. Uh, but with that being said, guys, it's it's about that time to close out the show. So if you guys want to help us out, one of the best ways to do that is to leave us a review over on iTunes. Uh, we're always looking for ways to improve the show, so if you guys have any feedback or uh, any suggestions for, like, topics that you want us to discuss on the show, we are always open ears. Uh, we do have Con Before the Storm and World of Podcast coming up, so if you're in the Anaheim area for BlizzCon, be sure to come uh, support this community event on November 1st, uh, which is a Thursday. Uh, so they have, you know, a meet and greet, there's an art gallery, uh, there's World of Podcast, so again, you know, we have an Overwatch panel, 10 p.m. till 11 p.m. on the fourth floor of the Hilton. So we have, you know, Rob May from Omnic Lab, we have Icy Sorrow from Enter the Iris, the Blevins from High Noon, uh, Andres from Omnic Lab, and I'll recap, my, my rival, Blazin' Bob... From Watchpoint Radio, I'll recap Prepare to Attack, as well as myself. And, uh, you know, I gotta shield our podcast directory, Overwatch Recall. Uh, we <laughs> have episodic listens posted every Sunday. Uh, and we release a new interview uh, where I had Rob May on, you know, speaking of the moderator from our World of Podcast panel. Uh, so I had Rob on this uh, this week to talk about Omnic Lab, about, you know, teaching his move to Japan. Uh, so definitely check that one out because it was a really good one uh, overall. But Ed, you know, there are a number of ways where our viewers and our listeners can get a hold of us. So why don't you uh, put them in the know in regards to that? All right. Well, you can reach us as always on email at Overwatch. You can reach us on the Twitter sphere at, at HND Overwatch. Uh, we do have a website in OWLNShow.com, so come check us out there. We are presently streaming live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash OWLNShow. Uh, so we are Twitch affiliates, so come support us, subscribe to us, the Mako Network Emoticon. Uh, so thanks again to everyone who's been watching our shows live and interacting with the chat. Uh, if you'd like to catch us live, we broadcast two nights a week. So Monday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, we have uh, Overwatch League Network. And then this show, Heroes Never Dies, on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific. And then host streams are held Thursdays and Fridays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Totem generally hosts on Thursday. Spider will host on Friday. Uh, and if I'm having a few drinks and feel like Overwatch, <laughs> I'll be on Thursday and Friday with them. Uh, and then we discord that you can come chat with us at at discord.me slash on show and then lastly we are on youtube at youtube.com slash c slash overwatch league network where we do have a new video up from spider mm -hmm. uh with all the changes that came like all the beta changes all that fun stuff so definitely go check it out it's a nice quick video so you can kind of get the visually see what all the changes right are. and and by beta he means the ptr changes that hit live servers see <laughs> beta ptr whatever um <laughs> <laughs> so go go check that out uh you can reach me personally on twitter at at Edinar overwatch uh totem where can they find you well i am over on twitter uh, that is at Little Blue Bird at Totally Drunk CTR. Uh, but yeah, I mean that that'll that'll be our show. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in tonight for Heroes Never Die episode one thirty two. Uh, again, I'm Totally Drunk, joined by always by my co-host Edinar, and we will see you back maybe tomorrow. Well, probably maybe. tomorrow. I mean, that's not to say that everyone's guaranteed to show up, but I will be streaming uh, some Overwatch tomorrow night. Maybe uh. Maybe some junk inside shenanigans, you know. Maybe not. Possibly. We'll have to see. Uh, but either way, guys, we hope to see you then. Have a good night. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to Heroes Never Die. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at HND Overwatch and join us on Discord at discord.me slash OWLN show.